what if there was a series that was just going to kind of float around the MCU, show alternate angles on things from a multiverse perspective, and just kind of have some fun in an unconnected kind of way? But what if the creative team behind said show decided to connect everything together in an absolutely awesome finale? Well, what if that's the subject of today's podcast? Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, I am absolutely pleased to have with me today director Brian Andrews and head writer AC Bradley to chat about season one of What If? Now, I absolutely love this. I've always been a fan of anthology storytelling. Twilight Zone was just my first exposure to it. And the greatest, of course, I dig Outer Limits too. And yes, I even like the 1980s version of Twilight Zone, their their reboot um, that I that I remember getting really into as well. Um, I love anthology storytelling. There's a lot of possibilities with it, and I knew it was going to be fun for them to poke around the MCU, see the different perspectives come at it from different angles, right? Just like uh, Tom Stoppard's fantastic play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, which looks at Hamlet from a slightly different and much more comedic angle. You could also see the movie as well, which is pretty amazing. Um, But uh, look, I love it when people do that. I love it when people kick the tires and look at a story from another angle. What I wasn't expecting was for them to tie it all together so perfectly in their finale, which was just a treat, for lack of a better word. I know that that's always thrown around a lot saying, oh, it's such a treat. But it really was because it was it was unexpected. I wasn't really sure what they were going to do to tie things up. But the stories were so separate from each other that it, of course, made great sense in a multiverse to figure out a way to bring them together, which is what they did. So this was a really fun interview to do. And special thanks again to Brian and AC for being so generous with their time, because I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And if you've never read us before, you could read our free issue, which is something I know Marvel fans will enjoy because it is our entire Avengers in-game issue. And, you know, there's a lot of other stuff in there as well. So you could poke around, but you could read our free issue through the Backstory app and at Backstory.net. And if you like what you read, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to become a subscriber, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And uh, look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners in iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers at the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview about What If Season 1 with director Brian Andrews and head writer AC Bradley. AC and Brian, how's it going? It's great to see you guys. It's lovely to meet you. How you doing? Excellent. I I absolutely loved uh, your show, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna just do one non spoiler question here. We're really, really, just seeing how you guys got the gig. It's always interesting to hear about <laughs> going into that room with Kevin Feige and everyone else. And I don't think anybody would have expected either of you to have been huge encyclopedic fans of uh, the What If series to begin with, but Tell us about your pitch or if there was something specific you said in the room that helped you land the gig. AC, starting with you. Um, I knew the guys at Marvel for a while. Um, Nate Moore brought me in a few times. I pitched on Captain Marvel, which I think might have been my first time pitching to Kevin, but I was under contract on another television show. So when What If popped up, I was kind of thrilled. To be honest with you, I had just come off writing almost 80 episodes of television and was kind of exhausted. But while I was spent three years writing 80 episodes of television, I would often have my TV on in the background, just on mute, airing Marvel movies. So when it came to what happens in the movies, I actually had a pretty good encyclopedic knowledge of, of the MCU up until that point. And I've always been a fan of the Marvel comics. I didn't know the what if ones as well. I had heard of them and I love the idea of kind of taking these characters and running in different directions. So Brad Winderbaum brought me in. You never know why you're meeting until you're sitting down in that conference room. And I was like, 
so what do you want to do? And he's like, we want to do an animated series. And my mo- I had a moment of, I just got off 80 episodes, man. I need a nap. But this was <laughs> too good of a show to come back to, too good of a project. I mean, it was the opportunity not just to write Captain Carter, but to write Iron Man, to write T'Challa, to write all these heroes, to introduce the Watcher to the MCU. It's like, all right, this is me coming back for one more, my last animated show. And it's been a blast. That's awesome. Brian? I've been doing, I've been working animation for forever, it seems. I'm freaking old. But also, um, I've been at Marvel doing live action boards for them for the movies, like, um, since Iron Man 2, but also a little bit even on Iron Man, just for a tiny little 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 snippet. And that started that process. And I've been on, you know, all the Avenger movies, all that stuff, work with the, the directors and all that, you know, trying to create these action sequences. And so I've known these guys for the bit. And then out of the blue and, and at, at the same time, still having a foot in animation, still working all that stuff. And then, um, so they knew this. And then, um, so Brad had the idea to do what if. And uh, then I guess I was his next call. He's just called, called me up and like, Hey man, you want to work on something cool? Like I was, I think I, I can't remember if I was, I was probably just, maybe I was finishing up one of the movies or whatever. I know there was, there's a, there was a lull period where I wasn't one, on one of their movies for like a little bit, tiny, tiny bit. Cause I've been on it nonstop it seems. And um, I was like, yeah, what is it? He's like, what if I'm like, sweet. Um, and the notion of trying to do it prestige level. I'm like, dude, if we're going to do this, it has to be prestige level. It can't be like some sort of like, low budget like thing you know like you know a finite amount of episodes that we can put a lot of em- emphasis in and genre all the rest of it and you know stories that are you know dark we got to move the needle of american animation if we're going to do this at all absolutely and Kevin and victoria were in total agreement they're like yep we're marvel we're not going to do anything less than that i'm like okay then cool so let's go for it and you know, the rest is history, you know, you've so. been a storyboard artist for years and you know, you've done a lot of live action and animation. And I'm curious, did you draw your own boards for this that you kind of got to the animators as, as, as your own rough? Yeah. Like, like early on when it was just one episode in the pipeline, I was able to do a lot more boarding. Um, so for captain Carter, there was a lot of stuff that I just straight up just did. Um, like the, the whole like Brandenburg Gate sequence where Peggy first uses her powers, the montage, you know, there's a number of stuff in the um in the ending a little bit here and there. But then as the s- things progress, I I don't have time because I'm doing all these other things. Right. So I don't have time to do many. But I would still be there either giving notes or even in the editorial bay. That's like the, my last opportunity to really like fix things that I feel need to like just get to that next level. So often I'll be working with um, Joel and Graham Fisher, our awesome editors, and just be sketching to have a workstation set up where I can sketch right away. Like, this is what we need right here. Boom. And he's like, ha ha. And they cut it right in live as we're going. So that's great. So even though I may not have fully boarded some of the other sequences, like, you know, and then I think there's a lot of the um, uh, Thor uh, Captain Marvel fight. I had, I kind of re went over and like just re reboarded and dove in a, a lot on that i've interviewed the pixar writers and directors for years and and just you know while we're still in the non-spoilers here you know their process is they they get their storyboards they get an animatic going they get voice actors in the animatic then they watch it mm-hmm. then they re-edit it and then finally once they're happy with it it goes into production quote unquote for high quality and you know they have <laughs> two or three years to do this and oh, yeah. redo their movie a few <laughs> times. How long yeah, is your have... average time per episode from start to finish? Well, when it came to actual production, it was only me and Matt Chauncey who wrote the scripts, which was all we mm-hmm. actually needed. Um, for He's my writing life partner, man. We would pro- basically spend about a month to two months on the scripts. Then they'd be off to the boards. And probably the entire production between like writing to final, like, animatic latch was about six months okay during that time we would have scratch actors in before we had the actual marvel actors in to do voices uh who really were a great help because they added so much emotion so we could see the characters and the boards together and um, and then we would like fix any problems and edit we have amazing editors joel and graham fisher as brian said and so we actually like Movies, man, they get years. We get months. It's the same kind of thing, just way less time. Yeah. And, and obviously you had Chadwick Boseman in before mm-hmm. he passed away, which was wonderful yeah. that, that T'Challa had actually so much to do in this series. 
really briefly, do either of you just have a fond memory of any time that you worked with Chadwick and, you know, what he was like uh, getting into this animated version of his character? He, he was awesome. You know, I, we got because the, the recorded the, the episode two before pandemic hit. So we got to have him come in like, you know, in person and see him and he's very theatrically trained and he likes to work that way. So he just wants to read through the script, including, including scene directions, all that stuff, just read the script. Like it's, you're reading a play and then hit the lines that way. Then once he did that a few times then he can go in and like hit lines specifically just to, to, to roll a riff on it. And so Ashley and I got to read with them. So, I mean, that, that was like so much fun to be like, wow. <laughs> like, we're reading with Javik Bozeman. Oh my gosh. It's like, I'm, I'm like reading Yondu and like in the scene and the thing, it's just like, it's nothing but a prison, blah, blah, blah. And we had recorded Michael Rooker earlier. So like his performance is still like fresh in my head. So I'm just like reading it kind of like the way he did it and just giving it that so that he'd have stuff to bounce off of. And that's fun. It's like, we're doing these little scenes with Chad with this legend. It's amazing. That's he was awesome. a sweetheart. He was great. So, so talented. All right. Well, so because we are limited on time, we are getting into the spoiler section right now. So podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify, YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. If you have not yet seen all the episodes, I would highly recommend pressing pause right now because we're going to get into the spoilers. The, the first place I want to start, which is, I think, the brilliance of the show, is that people are so used to watching superhero movies. And act one, mm. act two, there's the trials and tribulations, right? But act three, the hero's going to win, except for an infinity war, really. Um, and, uh, you know, basically these are episodes, and I was watching them with my kids who are 12 and 14 right now, okay. and um, they were just shocked that you could have an episode like the Doctor Strange episode where what if he lost his heart, not his hands, and he completely loses. There is no happy ending to that episode. There was absolute mm. brilliance in that. And there were other episodes like that as well. At what point did you realize in your process that to truly get into a Twilight Zone realm for what if, that the heroes needed to be seen as sometimes losing the battles rather than just winning them? What drew me to this project, what made it a, you know, a must-do was the fact that we were going to be able to play not only with different worlds, but with different genres and different aspects of storytelling. And the what if comics were kind of notorious for having these darker endings. And you're right, we're so conditioned to the hero has to win, the friendship saves the day, that being able to stand back and be like, okay, we're going to tell the story of Killmonger and Tony's friendship. Where would this end? No happy ending on the table. Like, just, just play it out. Where does it go? And it was really liberating as a writer, as a storyteller, because I don't know if I'll have that opportunity many times in my career to not only mix genre, tone, characters, but to say, we're going dark. And I hope everyone, like, you know, <laughs> has a good cry at nine in the morning. It's true. And that was even early on, we knew um, that it needed to be that just because the you know, the what if comics were that, but for me personally, I just felt that that was something I wanted to do in animation anyway. Like, you know, on some of our, the previous stuff I worked on, we would go to some dark places here and there, certainly on primal we did um, at times, like we just never know what type of, you know, trauma you might receive at a certain moment, but this was able to do it on another level. And I yeah. felt like animation can go there where we can tell any, any kind of story. It's not, it, Say it's safe in the sense that you've got talented filmmakers giving you a wonderful story, but but not safe in the sense that it's not going to work out maybe the way that you always wanted it to. You know, like animation can have teeth, yeah. animation can take you places that the live action goes all the time. Why can't animation? And I, I've always wanted that for animation, even when I was in college. It's like, why is everything just like you know, a happy go lucky Disney movie? can't there be so because i i loved anime and they were unafraid to go places that were different and that's what insane. that's what was such a great conversation to have after every episode because you know you hear mm -hmm. a lot about people saying oh i really want to think outside the box and try new things but sometimes in in filmmaking with large um popular ip uh you know intellectual yeah. property you don't get a chance because they won't let their ip go in that direction but was what was brilliant here was it seemed like there were almost no boundaries that you you couldn't cross and your your example of killmonger was beautiful because you were so dedicated to the character that we know that of uh -huh. course he's gonna do that of course he's gonna <laughs> kind of backpedal on everybody that he can to continue the power grab that he was always on so, I mean, it, uh -huh. there was such symmetry while at the same time 
going so far out there, that that would bring me to my next question. It's always interesting to hear about left turns. And so I'm curious if there was an episode that you were considering for a while, like maybe it was on your board, it was on your wall, and then you were just like, man, now we're going to try something else. Because it's always interesting to hear about that the discarded idea that was fun for an hour or a week. Um, There was a few ideas that we played with Mm -hmm. that, I mean, me and the other writer, Matt, spent an afternoon at, I kid you not, Mendocino Farms, just us talking about what if the Avengers showed up in Iron Man 3? What if Tony called in the Avengers? And I'm pretty sure everyone around us thought we were just two crazy fanfic writers. And that was just like us spitballing these characters and kind of following the path. Um, Before Mm -hmm. What If, I spent three years working for Guillermo del Toro. And one of the things he used to say in the edit bay is, if you make the audience care about the character in the first 10 minutes, they'll follow you anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Yeah. And Marvel actually did the groundwork for us. We already care about these characters. We love these characters. Totally. We have generations of kids growing up with them. So, Brian, do you remember a crazy idea that was discarded? You know, uh, there, there's a few that were pretty hilarious. There were, I know Ashley, there was one that she, she had that was like, you know, like, <laughs> like a, a Spider-Man body horror, like Cronenberg kind of thing. With this, oh, that great. was going to be like even darker than, than the Doctor Strange one because it was just like something like The Fly or something. Yeah. So it, it, hilarious. So there, there was definitely ones and there's a few others. That I, I mean, I don't even want to mention because who knows, you know, maybe maybe one day in the future. I don't know. But there was great, you know, um, there was a lot of really fun ones that would be fantastic. And oddly enough, I, if I remember correctly, even the Murder Mystery 103 episode, mm-hmm. we didn't have that one that way at first. It was almost like a couple different ideas. One that was like just a moment, like what if Hawkeye took the shot and like hit mm-hmm. Thor? And we're like, we, I, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, pretty amazing image. Let's just put it on the board for a second. We have no idea what the hell that is or where it mm-hmm. goes. And then, and Ashley had this fun idea about, you know, the Fury's big week, but the, originally it was, the idea was to try to maybe have it be, or we're just following Fury the entire time is, is like, damn it. Like he's getting another, like, he's just trying to put out the fires, you know, it's a bit on the attitude of, but that wasn't quite working exactly. Or if Kevin maybe wasn't vibing, but then somehow we got an idea where there was a few of these separate ideas that once we brought them together, Boom, it like clicked in a way that was fantastic and it became the episode that you guys like saw. Mm-hmm. So there is some of that where it's kind of like, here are some threads, here are some ideas, something's not working. Ooh, but if we took these two flavors and put them together, suddenly we have something. Fury's and that was fun. Week, yeah, Fury's Big Week originally, I think in the original pitch document was going to be more of a French farce. Uh, Brad Winter, right. yeah, our yeah. producer wanted to do something with the with the Big Week, um, which is a thing in, the, in canon that, you know, a deep right. cut for the fans but when we sat down like when i sat down to like figure out okay what how do we make a french farce i realized we can't it's not really le- leaning that way and when you look at fury the side i wanted to explore was like i want to shake him up because he's such a solid mm. character he's a man who always has his eye in the bigger picture who has his secrets i was like what if we just start stripping away everything he knows to be true everything mm-hmm. he loves and what where, where are we left so that entire episode was actually geared toward that diner scene that was what I was writing for. It's like, let me earn that moment of Nick Fury sitting over a cup of coffee late night in the diner going, did I make a mistake? I, it was it was a great episode. And, and, you know, again, I was really impressed with the finale because, you know, there was method to your madness in which, <laughs> yes, you did a zombie episode and you brought those zombies back as a part of the finale, which I thought was great. It wasn't always just a one off, but. Tell us when you realized that your finale was going to be this Guardians of the Multiverse concept, because I thought it was really fascinating. And it also toys with the Watcher always saying he can't get involved, but he does assemble that group. So let me let me know about your thoughts on that, of how involved he was or wasn't. We started discussing this notion of the Guardians of the Multiverse pretty much on like day two. As we're looking Mm -hmm. at our season, we knew, like in the comic books, the so watcher says, I can't, I can't, I can't interfere. I won't interfere. No, you can't make me. You can't make, okay, fine, I will. Um, we knew he wanted to play with that part of his story. So we just had to find a big enough villain. And thankfully, Ultron with the Infinity Gauntlet kind of, yeah, that's a guy that'll destroy the entire multiverse and force the watcher to intervene. So as we were crafting the series, it was kind of like keeping an eye out on which of these heroes, Brian, me, and the crew were kind of leaning toward. Who are we loving? 
And then the challenge when it came to kind of crafting those last two episodes was figuring out the Watcher's plan. It's like, okay, what would be the plan with these characters? How can we use them in a way that makes sense and stays true to who they are? Like, what would Killmonger's role be? He's not a typical hero or villain. What would he do? What would be his motivation? And his motivation at the end is, of course, power and also this notion of, I can keep my world the way I want it if I had this, which would obviously he'd obviously take that chance. <laughs> you know, just as, as we're running out of time, what was the toughest scene for each of you? What was the, the scene that you kept coming back to and sweating over and over? And how did you creatively rise to the challenge? Uh, Brian, starting with you and then, and then AC. That's a, that's a really hard question, actually, because there's so many different moments in, throughout the episode, whether it's just the creating of the episode or the production of the episode different challenges rise so that that's 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 like a really tough question I, it's like i can't even think of one like immediately that comes to mind that was difficult because every there's so right, many well, different challenges to make oh, something work ac ac could answer it if brian if it sparks something you you could jump in after it might, it might. okay go go the car scene in dr strange because originally oh. we used music <laughs> but we there was an issue with the rights although i should give a shout out to the indie band freddie and francine who are awesome um, we hit a speed bump and we had to pull the song from the episode. So there's literally a document on my hard drive of called four versions of this one scene. And I got to give a shout out to the amazing scratch oh, an actress, but she did our scratch for all our Marvel females, Alison Hayslip. Um, I was struggling with that scene. She's a good friend of mine and she was making a joke like on Twitter or something, or she texted to me that 10 years earlier, she won on the Price is Right. And I was like, what? I was like, she's like, yeah, you didn't know that? She's like, I was in The Price is Right, and I went both showcases. And it's I just crazy. had this motion. I was like, I love the idea of Christine Palmer referencing The Price is Right and Doctor Strange being like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but damn, you're adorable. Um, so <laughs> that scene was literally re- written and rewritten a few times due to production issues. And the final scene came from basically a moment of serendipity in Kismet and friends goofing off. That's great. That's great. Well, look, I know that we are out of time and I love talking to you guys. Hopefully we'll talk again, possibly before uh, your next season uh, to go further in depth with these episodes. But I loved What If. It was a complete success. Brian, AC, thanks so much for your time today. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to director Brian Andrews and head writer AC Bradley for being so generous with their time and coming down to chat about What If season one. And folks, you know, while you're surfing around online, I hope you'll also consider checking out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And you know, if you've never read us before, I got to say, you'll really enjoy our free issue, which you could read at Backstory.net or the Backstory app, because it is the Marvel Avengers in-game issue. And you know, you could read the whole issue for free. And if you like what you read, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to subscribe, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page consider subscribing to my passion project So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. Folks, you know, if you want to reach out to me, you can always find me on Twitter as Yo Goldsmith, or you can always find me running the Backstory underscore Mag account on Twitter. It's those same two profiles, actually, on Instagram, Yo Goldsmith and Backstory underscore Mag. You can find me sometimes uh, at the Facebook fan page for Jeff Goldsmith. I'm sometimes there. And uh, you could always write an email if you want to backstoryletters at gmail.com. And I promise not to respond immediately because that email box gets clogged. But I will respond, I promise, because I like going through it and seeing what y'all have to say. Look, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.